This is the last chapter. Chapter 17, Young Men's Visions. The young man walked down a rural path before climbing the mountain leading to the next village. He had no spare clothes, although the journey had started with him carrying a bundle of old ones, and he had also worn several sets himself. He had left them all in a previous country settlement as he traveled from day to day. He had no bicycle either. He had given that away, too. In his pocket was a sweet potato donated by the grateful villagers who subsisted on them, and had nothing else to give them except a blessing. Give him. He had walked into the countryside and told those he met about his Lord. They welcomed him and his Jesus, too. He prayed for them, and many were miraculously healed of diseases. Then he took his Bible and tore a few pages out, for they had none. He laid his hands on them so that they could receive the power of the Holy Spirit and pray for the sick. Then he left a changed people and walked on, promising to return when he could. Another young man lived in an urban block thirty-odd stories high, with multitudes on every floor. He had no contact with other believers, for it was an era when this was forbidden. But he had been curiously transformed in his own life when some time before his heroin habit had overwhelmed his veins. How strange that a dead Jesus, apparently alive again, could physically quiet a body and urge a heart into leaping joy. With the track marks yet on his arms, but a deeper impression in his heart, this youth had found hope and a reason to live. After he had come off drugs, when someone prayed for him, in this living Lord's name he was transformed, body and soul. He sang in his one-room apartment. He shared what had happened with the elderly neighbor, who lived alone, and had an aching pain in her wrist. She was healed, too, and then they often sometimes sang together. Then they found a homeless tramp who camped on the landing, and they touched him, too. These were my dreams, knowing not what the future might bring in a political sense, or what would be permitted in terms of a formal structure. I always had wished for such simplicity, no need for organization. One poor man reaching one poor man. Love your neighbor as yourself, seemed to sum it up. Our young people are unlikely dragon slayers. Most have failed society, school, and parents. But they have an unearthly courage. A group of them used to visit a certain city in Asia and found over time a gang of flower sellers. They were children. They were slaves. These were children who, along with others, had left home, which was often several days away by train. Some of them had been unwanted, one of them had been sold several times, as he was an orphan and some families wanted a son or a worker. He was beaten and ill-treated and ran away only to be sold again. Another was already bent like an old person, for as a young child he had to carry boulders strung to his back like the adults did. They came to the city hoping for money. They slept by the railway station and found a way to make some money. Some sold their bodies, and many contracted diseases of a deadly nature. The very young ones sold flowers to tourists, but they never kept their money. The boss who gave them the flowers took their earnings and their pre precarious freedom. He controlled them. Ah Chi, with her team of young, lame people, met them and slowly made friends. They loved them and took them to eat noodles or hamburgers. One famous franchise holder noticed this and allowed them to meet in his outlet. He had seen the plight of the kids and the persistence of the Hong Kong teenagers. One young girl waited in wonder for the group who loved her, touched her, washed her, and prayed for her. Her situation was not good. Although she had found Jesus, she still lived on the streets under the imprisonment of her controller. She had no money and nowhere to go. Achi found the flower seller boss and pleaded for the little girl's freedom. In one short explosion, the exploiter apparently was bombed. What had hit him, he knew not, but suddenly the man cried and cried. He did not understand why he was so moved, but as Achi talked, the boss was unbelievably awash with contrition. She told him of the God who sent his son to die for the child and for him too, that both could be truly free. He gladly accepted such a savior and released the girl as well. One of the team bought train tickets, although he himself had little money. We could not finance him, so he had to pray, like us, for rice and travel money. Having spent all, 
he took the child with him back to her original family. They rode the train for days and nights to reach their destination. This story has been repeated numerous times, except that in each instance it is a different boy or girl. Often the families receive them back gladly and are themselves greatly affected by a love that they have never heard or guessed of. Aleung was taken home in this fashion. On arriving at his house, his mother rushed out in tears. She had remarried when he was a young boy, and the second husband had rejected her son, so he ran away and was lost for years. Let me tell you what happened to me, she blubbered and heaved. Let me tell you. It turned out that six months before, she had somehow heard of Jesus and had become a believer. Since then, she had prayed nonstop. I did not know where Aleung was. I did not know which city he was in. I did not know how to find him, so I prayed, Please, God, wherever my son is, please send some Christians to him. Her prayer was answered. My dreams came true. Ka Ming and Esther were the ones who reached out to a new generation in Hong Kong with the same problems as the previous ones, but set in quite a different living condition. A new middle class had emerged and a wider form of social security. The new youth were able to enjoy compulsory secondary education and a higher standard of living than their parents have. Many were given watches, credit cards, rollerblades, and material possessions. A great number, though, still missed out on being listened to or cared for. They were pressed into performance-oriented schooling and fell out of the system. If you have fallen out, it's hard to get back. Ka Ming tried to give them some hope through meeting them in playgrounds and befriending them. Many, however, had already joined another system and followed the hordes that seldom went home, slept outside, and experimented with drugs and sex. I do not see them as problems, though, Ka Ming told me with stars in his eyes. If God could change me, then he can help them too. He saw them as possible dragon slayers, a band of young men with new hearts and godly values, willing to use their vigor and lives to serve the unlovely and unfound. He saw the cities of Asia touched in practical and miraculous ways by a youth who would choose different values than those that their parents had been trapped into serving for survival or promotion. He saw teens and young people in their twenties not trying to go up into the world, but willing to reach down. Chi Ho, who had tattoos up and down both legs, found himself in someone else's city. He still had the gelled hair nicely done in spikes, and that year wore trousers that looked as if they would fall off at any moment. Certainly, chains had fallen off his own life, although part of the current gear necessitated them trailing from his low-slung belt. He came across an old lady who was blind in two eyes and pained in one leg. Please pray for her sight. He was invited by a team leader who lived in that city. Chi Ho did not quite feel up to praying for her blindness, but thought he could manage the leg. He laid his hands on it, and, as had been done for himself just one year previously, he said, In Jesus' name, be healed. The woman squawked in her language and thrashed about in huge emotion. What happened? he asked of the interpreter. How is the leg? She says, she says, stuttered the interpreter. She can see clearly with both eyes. 